What's going on, everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my review of Fallout 2. Now, I personally play and review a ton of CRPGs, as well as a lot of other games, and one of the bigger titles that was missing from my list of reviews, especially in the CRPG genre, was the Fallout series, or more specifically, Fallout 2. And while I was pretty familiar with the main story, I had not really dug into a lot of the side content that was available previously when I played this almost like 20 years ago. So that made it kind of convenient for me to have an excuse to jump into the game, explore a lot of that side content, and then share some thoughts with the people who asked me for it. First things first, it's worth noting that I am playing this on Steam. Now, typically speaking, when it comes to older games, Steam is not known for being a great place to get them. However, in the case of Fallout 1 and 2, Back in, I believe it was 2013 or so, both Fallout 1 and 2 got an update on Steam that actually paired them with a couple of high-resolution mod packs and stuff built into the game that fixes a lot of the common problems that were prevalent with the game prior. So playing the game on Steam actually will come with those high-res packs, which does make your experience a little bit better. Next up, let's talk a little bit about the development of this game because I find it interesting. And with these older games, I like to cover that kind of thing. Fallout 2 was originally released in 1998, which is about a year after the original title was released in 1997. Fallout 2 was also released the same year as the original Baldur's Gate, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. But that's especially interesting because the development of Fallout 2 actually started before the first game had even released, which stands out to me because... Fallout 1 was actually considered a very low-budget title for Interplay at the time, so the fact that they greenlighted work on the second game before the first one was even released struck me as very odd, and I wanted to call it out here. But after the obvious financial success of Fallout 1, which actually did very well sales-wise, it's no surprise that they didn't, you know, cancel the project or something. Now, Fallout 2 itself, broadly speaking, kind of sought to expand Fallout 1 in every way possible. And we're going to dive into all of that stuff, but I just wanted to mention that up front. Let's talk story setup. Honestly, I don't really care about spoiling a 24-year-old game, but while there definitely will be some spoilers in this, I'm not going to go over the story in any great depth because honestly, there's just so many videos on YouTube that cover it in insane detail already. I just don't feel the need to. But that said, the basic story setup is that you are the descendant of the original Vault Dweller from the first game. That Vault Dweller went on to found the village of Arroyo after being kicked out of his own vault at the end of the first game. Arroyo is now dying. They need you to go find a Garden of Eden creation kit to save your village. And while doing so, you realize that some weird agency is kind of causing all sorts of problems around the wasteland. And when you finally retrieve the Gek, your village gets attacked and kidnapped. And then you have to track down the Enclave somehow. Now, I want to mention some specific things about the story while we're talking about it. For starters, it's much longer than the original game. The original game was pretty short, looking at like 10 to 15 hours of playthrough. And while there was a good amount of replayability there, you could do and see basically everything there was to see in probably 30 to 40 hours if you're really pushing it. But you compare that to Fallout 2, and it's much longer, like the story itself, if you go in completely blind, I would say will probably run you between 30 and 40 hours. However, there is a ton of side content in this game, so you could easily spend 80 hours plus on a single playthrough, depending on how specifically you want to dive into those things, I would say. And also, while we're at it, in addition to being a much longer story, it actually also adds a ton of options. There's just a lot more opportunity to roleplay your character, which definitely makes it feel a bit more defined than the first game, because while there were, of course, roleplaying options in the first game, it was pretty straight and to the point, so it kind of was a little difficult, in my opinion, to really feel attached to your character because the game wrapped up so quickly. Whereas there's just so much to do in Fallout 2 with your character, I feel like you're really going to become attached to that person and kind of decide who that person is for yourself. And in that way, from a role-playing perspective, I think Fallout 2 does a much better job with the story about letting you make the character you want to make. And then last thing about the story, I want to actually talk about the last boss. So a bit of spoilers here without too much context, but Frank Horrigan is an amazing last boss. He has 999 HP, I believe, which is like the max amount possible. He also does an insane amount of damage, and while it is absolutely possible to kill him via combat, they also made several other ways around him, 
where if you, for instance, have a high speech and a decent amount of science, it's actually pretty easy to kill him without barely touching him yourself at all. Though, unlike the original game, there is no complete speech option to just completely bypass the fight like there was with the master. But my favorite thing, honestly, about the Frank Horrigan fight is his death animation because it's honestly incredible. But I actually lied. One more thing about the story I want to mention before we move on. My only real gripe with the main story is that it can feel a little convoluted depending on how you tackled the exploration of the game because it's very easy to find out a lot of different stuff at a lot of different times, which can honestly make the main story of the game a little hard to follow because a lot of the context and everything comes from exploring the optional areas and then downloading information from hollow disks, which is a really clunky mechanic, to be honest. So it can be difficult to get the information that makes the main story make more sense, especially someone who's not familiar with how these old games play. I could see the main story being a bit convoluted because a lot of the information is again locked away in side areas, which can be a little frustrating in my opinion. But moving on, let's talk about character creation a little bit. Now, this, of course, uses the Fallout special system from the first game, and it is primarily the same as the first game. And I talked about it a good bit in that review. So here I want to talk more about the things that change, or at least a little bit of the stuff that change. Now, at its core, we still have the same thing. We pick our attributes from the special acronym. Those attributes define our base amount of skills. We can pick some traits, which give us a benefit in exchange for a detriment. And then as we level up, we will get some perks. Now, there were some refinements made to how some of this stuff actually worked. For instance, the outdoorsman skill was almost useless in the first game. Not completely, but mostly. Whereas in the second game, it's much more important, primarily because it will let you skip combat encounters out in the uh, open world, the random encounters that is. You'll get an option to just bypass them. And that is important because apparently the rate of random encounters was actually determined by your CPU's processor speed. You'll actually see a lot more random encounters in Fallout 2 than you are supposed to, I guess would be the way to put it. So having a high outdoorsman skill, especially these days in this game, is almost essential because otherwise you are just going to be bombarded with random encounters and it gets pretty annoying pretty quickly. But there was a lot of stuff like that done just across the board. For instance, a lot of the skills are represented as skill checks in a lot of the side content. And while in Fallout 1... With the level cap being 21, it very much so felt like you could potentially make a character that was a bit of a dud. Whereas in Fallout 2, the level cap is actually 99, which means while your character will start the game a little weak, that higher level cap, honestly, if you grind it out or use an exploit after you finish the game, well, I don't want to say exploit, the devs added it to the game, but there is a feature that unlocks after you beat the last boss that will actually just let you power level your character to like level 99 in a few minutes. And at that point, your character basically becomes a god among men. That said, the beginning of the game is much more focused on melee characters, which is probably something to keep in mind during character creation. You can get by the early game without being a melee focused character, but it is going to be a little more difficult for you because you don't start the game with a gun and ammo is a little sparse right at the beginning. That said, the developers seem to know this because there are a few trainers in the early game that will actually boost up your melee skill a bit, which can help you out quite a lot. Now, before we move on to world building, I did want to mention as well that there are a lot of options in the menus and stuff to adjust combat difficulty, the speed of animation, so you can speed up combat a ton. And there's a lot of options in the option menu to actually make playing this older game much less of a chore. So if you're looking to play this older title for yourself, I would say definitely explore those options in the menu to make it less of a hassle for yourself, as some of the game is a bit clunky. But with that out of the way, let's talk world building. So world building, as I mentioned, this game largely focused to expand on basically everything that the first game did. Functionally speaking, the world is about probably twice the size of the first game with many, many more locations and size areas. A lot of the locations themselves are just bigger in general than the first game. There's a ton of stuff to find, a ton of stuff to explore, and it is a game that is honestly kind of just packed with content considering the year it came out. But that said, it does function much the same. There is a world map that you'll be traveling along, which will transport you from location to location or the cities, etc. While traveling that world map, you can hit random encounters like I already mentioned. However, even this saw a bit of an expansion because in this particular title, you can get a functional car. It does have to be fixed and then bought, and then you can actually upgrade it as well, but you have to keep the car charged with either energy cells or microfusion cells. 
which can be a little annoying to be honest, but it's not so bad once you get later in the game. And then from there, a lot of the world building is kind of centered around, uh, again, on just expanding everything from the first game. We see a ton of stuff around the FEV and how it has been used in experiments, etc., to kind of alter what the FEV does. We see the expansion of the sort of tribalism that early humans are actually known for and kind of makes sense in a post-apocalypse world. We also see this on display later in New Vegas because New Vegas took a lot of its world building from Fallout 1 and 2. And luckily, a lot of this expansion comes with, again, just tons of more ways to roleplay your character through just straight up more options as well as more skill checks. The karma system is even more relevant in this game. In the first game, the karma system was largely irrelevant. However, in the second game, it's much more important. Having negative traits, like for instance, killing a kid in game will give you the child killer trait, if you will. And some like NPCs just won't deal with you. If you have that, you can become a slaver, which will give you a tattoo on your forehead. And then some NPCs, etc. won't talk to you. All that kind of stuff. There's just a lot more actions to take and there's a lot more consequences to those actions. And in that way, the world does kind of really feel alive, which for a game that came out in 1998 is genuinely impressive. However, it's not without its detriments because the other thing that all this expansion actually did is unfortunately it adds a ton of like fourth wall breaking type of stuff and it gets to a point where it's just a little ridiculous how much they stuffed in here where you can't even go to a single location without there being some kind of reference to some sort of pop culture thing that was going on at the time and it gets to be a little bit silly how much they packed in there. Now post game after you beat the final boss and finish the main story you can keep playing and then at that point, a lot of the NPCs and stuff will actually say a lot of fourth wall breaking stuff to you, which I don't mind as much because it's after you've completed the game. But there's just a ton of it everywhere throughout this title. It's honestly insane how many references and Easter eggs they packed in here. And it gets a little much, frankly. Also, a bit on the detrimental side, there are some bugs in the end screens for a lot of the outcomes of quests and stuff to where sometimes your role playing actions don't really make too much of a difference in terms of the end screen of a certain area. That is to say the outcome from doing all your quests for that area. So some of that stuff just doesn't play properly, which can be a little frustrating seeing how much role playing that they actually added to the game to then not get to reap your reward of an end screen at the end of the game because of a bug. Now let's talk combat a little bit. Combat is basically the same as the first game. And as I've reviewed that game, I'm not going to cover it in a ton of depth, but basically it is an action point turn based system. Every round, you can take actions that cost action points until you've used all of your action points. And this goes for your enemies as well as your companions, which we'll talk about in a minute. And by and large, combat is much the same. However, it does spice up the progression a bit. In Fallout 1, there was a very, very clear-cut progression to basically any kind of build. However, in Fallout 2, they added a ton of weapons as well as armors, etc. And there is a lot more nuance to what is the best in any given situation, as opposed to a clear cut, this is the best for this type of build that we saw in the original game. So in that way, they actually did expand combat a little bit in Fallout 2, which was primarily done through gear and variations thereof. But truthfully, the combat is not bad by any means, but if you're playing this old game, I imagine the combat is likely going to be the worst part of it for you. Not to say it's impossible or just beyond terrible or anything. It's just real average in a game that is otherwise really great. Now, let's talk companions. There are, I believe, 14 permanent companions. Some of those companions are intended to be a detriment to you, such as the pariah dog or potentially your spouse if you got a bit of a shotgun marriage in Modoc. Those companions are actually not good and they count against your companion limit because you're only allowed to have a number of companions equal to, I believe it is, half your charisma. And these detrimental companions take up those slots until you either get them killed or get them out of your party in another way because the detrimental companions are often unable to be just shooed away like a regular companion. Now that said, the companions themselves, they do have a bit more story than the original game's companions, which only had four companions to begin with. We actually do see a repeat in Dogmeat through a special encounter. But other than that, they're pretty much all new. And again, they actually do have a bit of story and they do have interactions with the world. But because of the pretty tight party limit, it can be hard to see or use all of them in a single playthrough. They absolutely can die. That's very simple. But one of the big upgrades companions saw in this game 
is the inclusion of combat AI for them, if you will. In the first game, companions were actually added as a bit of an afterthought, which led them to run on a script rather than be coded into the game properly, which is why they behave like just idiots in the first game. Whereas in the second game, they give you a bit of an AI toggle for how you want that companion to behave. And in addition to those things, you can also set their equipment and trade with them much more efficiently. So companions saw a huge upgrade just in the amount of story they actually got as well as the upgrades to being able to control them and use them in combat so they don't, you know, die or hit you more than they hit the enemy, for instance. Now, from there, let's talk some positives and negatives and wrap this up. On the positive end of things, the game holds up really well in terms of the actual content. I think the story's pretty fun. There's a lot of options that make playing this game, even as old as it is, honestly a lot easier than a great many older CRPGs. This is a pretty easy title to jump into. In addition, there's just tons of content. These older CRPGs tend to be a little short, but Fallout 2 is probably one of the longest of the older ones for sure. Combine that with what I personally am a sucker for, and that is just all of this opportunity to roleplay your character. In Fallout 2, there is a main story, yes, but how you approach it and being who you want to be is kind of at the forefront of how you do all of this stuff, honestly. And it's impressive, again, especially as old as this game is, with just how much role-playing was available to you. And while there are parts where I would have preferred a few more options, that type of thing, it nonetheless has aged incredibly well, all things considered. Now, no game is without its negatives, so let's talk about those. For starters, the inventory system is hot garbage. On top of that, the base game has limited saves. This is something that mods have solved, if that's of interest to you, but the base game only lets you keep 10 saves, which is pretty restrictive for a game that has as much content that you would like to do something like, you know, save scum to see the branching options type of stuff. Without a mod, the game is really not built for that. Also, it's possible to dig yourself into a bit of a hole in the early game, less so in the late game as you have more options, but it is very possible to create a character that just gets stuck in a situation they can't really get out of due to how the beginning of the game is structured, again, around melee characters being a little more viable through the early hours of the game, which makes it very possible to get a character just kind of stuck if you don't know what you're doing which can be a little frustrating. And for a game that otherwise holds up very well and is easy for people to jump into, I found that especially annoying, especially with the combination of the limited save system. Now, my only real other negative for this game is that the story, again, doesn't always make the most sense depending on how you approached it. So while they have these really broad open objectives, it's possible to get places or trigger things to happen in a sequence that doesn't make the most sense, I would say. And again, a lot of the context for a lot of actions that are taking place tend to be locked off in side areas that you may or may not ever see, which when combined with the kind of fourth wall references and stuff that happen throughout the game, I found a little off-putting. And I think that's why, in general, the story stands out a little less than, say, the confrontation with the master. Not to say Fallout 2 doesn't have its really great moments or anything, but in my opinion, that's where it falls flat just a little bit. Now, before we wrap this up and draw a conclusion, I did want to mention one thing that I wasn't really sure where to put anywhere else. And that is that, frankly, I loved the Enclave oil rig. So this is the very end of the game. It's like the last dungeon, if you will. And there's just so many options and so many ways to approach handling everything that is going on in that oil rig. I was enthralled, honestly. That is hands down the best part of the game, in my opinion. Seeing it all wrap up, finally getting answers to questions, and just all the ways you can approach everything going on in that oil rig, which all then culminates with a boss fight that is incredibly memorable especially depending on how you approached it. Hands down, the best part of this game, in my opinion, is the Enclave oil rig. And I really wanted to put that somewhere in this review, so there you go. Now, in terms of a conclusion, I think there are parts of Fallout 2 that are honestly a little annoying. Like I mentioned, all the fourth wall stuff, some of the clunkiness around the inventory, etc. But in spite of those things, Fallout 2 is a surprisingly large game with a ton of ways to roleplay. And the fact that this title came out in the same year as Baldur's Gate is kind of insane to me, really. But it's very easy to play Fallout 1 and 2 and see why they became the gigantic franchise that they became. And while I personally do prefer more high fantasy settings, 
it is very easy to see why people love this series so much after you play a title like Fallout 2. There you go, guys. There is my sort of retrospective review of Fallout 2. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. If you did, by all means, subscribe, stick around. I do all sorts of CRPG stuff, and I've reviewed a ton of CRPGs if you want my thoughts on those as well. And maybe even consider joining the channel as a member if you feel so inclined. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.